Since 1995, over 26,000 international students from all walks of life join the British Investigators' training courses in Anomalous Phenomena, the only courses of their kind. Constructed by the world's leading academics and brilliant minds within ufology, paranormal and supernatural, parapsychological study, anomalous phenomena, science, hypnotherapy, spiritualism, astrology, astronomy, cryptozoology and many other areas, our certified self-study courses will teach you how to assess, analyze, engage, formulate, document and be cognizant of all types of phenomena suitable for light workers and star seeds curious personalities and inquisitive minds skeptics alike and truth seekers for more information please visit www.stellaruniversity.com Thank you for being punctual. I know we didn't. We don't want to take too long, much time. It's a, it's a 4:32. So um, we're going to go till six, right? Maybe we'd go longer, but we need to be out of here around six. And then afterwards, we'll be outside and we can just talk and visit. <clears throat> if you brought books, I'm happy to sign them or whatever. Um, but the auditorium, they want us out a little after six. So this next section, what I really want to focus on is the techniques in consciousness, um, how you make contact using awareness and coherent thought and group coherence <clears throat> as a team. Now, you know, the, the, the special thing about close encounters of the fifth kind is that it's the first category that was uh, described that connotes humans empowering themselves to make contact as opposed to a passive event. In other words, a close encounter of the first kind uh, in the sort of categories would be a sighting of a craft within a certain distance. A close encounter of the second kind is when it leaves some kind of physical evidence. It may be electromagnetic, it may be a landing trace like in the Provence case where there was an ET craft that landed in a lavender field etc. and so on. A close encounter of the third kind, you all know from Steven Spielberg's movie, is when it involves the sighting of or involvement with a, uh, an extraterrestrial uh, biological uh, or living being being seen. A close encounter of the fourth kind is when someone has an experience and they contact, they're contact and they're taken on board a craft. But a close encounter of the fifth kind is when humans deliberately make contact and invite them to come. Very important distinction because it's the first category that involves human initiated and cooperative contact. And so Dr. Haynes at NASA Ames Research Center wrote a compilation uh, of cases that I had started in a book called Close Encounters of the Fifth Kind. The term Close Encounters of the Fifth Kind or CE5 was one that I sort of coined in, in 1990. Or Oh, oh, if it could move to the right, I could see it better, and it moves to the right or move to the left, where it would be the person wouldn't be speaking it verbally, but just thinking, but in a directed intent way, a very clear way, and the ET craft <clears throat> would respond. And there's a whole category of these uh, and a collection of them that exist that are uh, mentally actuated CE5s as opposed to light signaling or what have you. <clears throat> Those are the ones that really got my interest. That uh, followed on to what happened to me when I was 18 years old and I was up in the mountains of North Carolina at the uh, far tower. Now they call it far tower, it's a fire tower. But in the mountains of North Carolina they call it a far tower. So, so the Far Tower experience was, um, uh, I'm from North Carolina, so I can make fun of it. Uh, you can't. Anyway, <laughs> you Yankees, I'm just joking. <clears throat> but this was a really amazing experience because it was all based on the fact that the ETs were interested in a guy who was experiencing the Samadhi. And <clears throat> there's more to the story than I'm related. It's a very long story. 
But the key component of it was that I got the message was it could have been anybody, but they were interested in hum a human and experiencing that state of consciousness who would kind of understand in the future how it could be used. This may have started earlier because I had a sighting, daytime sighting, like the disc we were showing earlier, um, when I was about eight or nine which was followed by me having a lot of lucid dreams with these creatures that kind of freaked me out because I was a little kid and I would <clears throat> find myself in you know waking up under the bed kind of like but I realized that these civilizations were with us all the time if we'd open to them and between the ages of I'd say 8 and 12 I was really interested in the subject. I mean, it was back, of course, in, in the 60s. And um, it was a period when, believe it or not, there were you know, magazines like Argosy and Life and other magazines that would have it on the cover. Major sightings, major events. <clears throat> and I began to collect all these and think, oh, wow, this is so, and I was almost obsessed. Until I went into adolescence, sort of found, you know, forgot about it all until I had this experience happen six months after the near-death experience. The consciousness experience that happened showed me that the mind that allows each of us to be awake is always tied into this cosmic consciousness. We just choose not to connect to it um, for whatever reason. But we can, as easily as we've sh shut that off, we can open the cage, as it were, and let our, the bird of our soul fly through this higher consciousness and higher spirit. Um, it takes some discipline and some effort, and doing it on a regular basis helps if you're doing a use of the meditation approach. But I feel that the main thing that people have to first accept is that this is something everyone's birthright is that they can experience the fullness of their cosmic multi-dimensional self. There's a man, many of you may have heard his name, named Ingo Swan, and he was a friend of mine before he passed away. And I was once with him up at his um, uh, apartment up in New York, and we were talking about this. And he was a very renowned remote viewer who, much to his later regret, got involved with uh, military intelligence and the DARPA programs and Stanford Research International and other entities. But he and I were talking about this and that, you know, one of the, the problems is that people think that this is a, some sort of a special ability that only certain people have. Then that's completely wrong. It's an ability that certain people give themselves in an imaginative way and make the effort to develop. And, you know, Paramahansa Yogananda said that it's because of the lack of spiritual adventuresomeness and because of spiritual lassitude that people don't have more of these gifts and more of these, what are in the Vedas, called cities, S-I-D-D-H-I-S, these abilities and powers. So it's really latent within every single human, but also every single sentient being. Because if we're dealing with higher intelligence, in other words, not microbes from another star system, but civilizations that are in starships, they're conscious and they have conscious intelligence. And guess what? Whatever it is that they've developed, we can develop. Or whatever humans have experienced in the most enlightened person on Earth, these civilizations can also experience. Because it's all folded, and this is where it's truly egalitarian and de democratic, the universe is placed within the structure of conscious awareness, the completeness of that experience that can unfold and unfold and unfold and unfold for everyone, everyone who's a conscious sentient being. I remember some years ago there was a, a man named um, <clears throat> Art Bell who had a radio show on uh, co something called Coast to Coast and I used to be on his show periodically and um, some of you may have heard of it and he had a contest once to see who could remote view something he had put on his refrigerator all with you know just stuck a something on his refrigerator with a magnet and that he was seeing if anyone could actually go into this state of consciousness and do it and a man called up 
and saw precisely what it was. And it was a C-SETI member from San Diego who was, uh, I think, a land surveyor and title examiner, just sort of a salt of the earth guy that you'd see, you know, you'd have a beer with. I mean, he was not like he was some, he was an Ingo Swan. <laughs> and Art Bell said, how in the world did you do this? He said, well, I, you know, I went to this training thing with Dr. Greer and learned just to do this where I could become clear and centered and then go into that state and intend to see distant places. And it works. And it was just this ordinary guy that you would see anywhere. And I, I tell that story only to emphasize that people get into a sort of a, a shtick about these things. You know, a certain way you dress and a certain way you look and you've got to have this thing and that thing. Well, you know, here's the truth. We have a guy who wrote to us recently in Croatia who's a truck driver who was practicing the, the meditation at a rest when he was along a remote area and went into that state, centered quiet consciousness, did the deep meditation, and then re did the remote viewing of space and the area and just sent a call out to the ETs and showed them, zoomed in on where he was, like a GPS. And within a few minutes, this craft materialized and floated over his truck. And he wrote in about this, and he was a truck driver. So I, I, sort of, I totally reject this idea that somehow um, what I'm about to share and take you through this process uh, as an introductory uh, teaching experience is something that so-and-so can do, but I can't. You see what I mean? Because, and, and it's really important for people own their own power. Because if you say you can't do something, you won't. I don't care what it is. I mean, if I were to tell myself as a doctor, I really can't do a, a, a tracheal cut down, and you know, because someone's larynx, the voice box is crushed, and I'm there convincing myself I can't, I couldn't. So anything you do in life, if you go into it with the attitude of a negative, a little gremlin on your shoulder saying, oh, I can't do this, but so-and-so can. You're going to convince yourself you can't and you won't. So, you know, the old saying, as ye have faith, so shall your powers and blessings be. So in other words, if you have, and it's not faith in something that's like a belief system, but if you have the positive confidence that something can happen, it, it will happen. But if you convince yourself it can't happen, it won't. So the mind is a very powerful thing. And I would say that before we start this, just forget those thoughts that you can't do X, Y, Z. And accept the fact that you are right now hearing my voice and you're awake, most of you. <laughs> and if you're conscious and awake, <clears throat> you can become aware of just consciousness. And in that quiet moment, that calm and centered quiet mind, this is the trick. You can intend, but not intellectualize, just intend quietly to know or see a distant place, a distant thing, or something you want to know. And it will emerge. If you practice this, it'll just come into awareness. You don't have to force it. It's a very relaxed, natural state. Now, there are many techniques for remote viewing. My uh, own personal preference are ones that involve <clears throat> the overall development of the person's consciousness and spirit in an organic way as opposed to a technology or an external thing that kind of tricks the mind to be able to do it. I'm not casting aspersions on other approaches. I just think a safer approach is one that is more meditative and that allows you to use what you were hardwired with and softwired with if you want. You have all the hardware and software you, uh, software you need to do this. So every single human being, by virtue of being conscious, can practice techniques to become just aware of awareness. And in that quiet place, when you get really deeply centered, then you can intend to just see another place. And that can be on the, someone's refrigerator to see what they put, or it can be something out by Mars, or it can be something around the rings of Saturn, where there's a very large interstellar craft 
several hundred miles in diameter, by the way. Um, and it can be another star system. Why? Distance doesn't exist because remember the nature of the mind is an omnipresent field. It's non-locality. So you don't have limitation in the field of consciousness or thought. Once you understand that the mind, in this, if you become connected to this quiet aspect of your own consciousness, I'm not talking about someone else's consciousness, just your own awake mind, I liken it to the fact that everyone here are like a unique, beautiful window, creation, in a vast cathedral of creation. And that the light that illuminates each window, no matter how different it may be, is a singularity, the sun. And so in reality, the light whereby we are sentient and conscious is actually always the same light. That those photons and that light is coming from the same central source, to use the analogy. And therefore, every single person who's conscious and awake, yes, you, you can accept and embrace your diversity and your uniqueness of who you are. You don't lose that. But you can simultaneously be connected to the source of the light of your own mind, the light of your own existence, the light of consciousness, which is a singularity. It's one single conscious being, state of being. And that experience, once you begin to practice it regularly, you know, throughout the day, every day, you find that you can use it in all kinds of ways. You can be driving down the highway and feel where the highway patrol are. Huh? Well, uh, shh. <laughs> or, <laughs> slow down. Or, you're doing some work. You know, I know of people who have been uh, pilots who have had an intuitive knowledge of something and known how to correct an emergency situation. So, you know, people have these experiences of flashes of intuition or knowledge, but let's talk about where does that come from. It comes from the fact that the mind that allows us to be awake and functioning and sentient is simultaneously always tied into this, the great mind, the central computer, if you will, of conscious intelligence of creation that's beautiful and infinite and eternal. So that aspect of ourselves, we can either be open to or shut off from. And we can choose or not choose, and we have free will. I would say let's choose to open up to it and, and then it begin to enjoy it and use it for the good. And I, I, I tell the story of this, uh, I, I don't want you to think that this is something that's reserved for only CE5 going out and making contact. This actually informs and changes every aspect of your life. Um, Back some years ago, I was in the emergency department and a man came in with what was appearing to be the flu, very sick, and it was flu season. And the nurse put the man in a, just a regular room. And I went in and I felt, I could see, sense, you know how animals, I always say like dog, I love dogs, but you know how they can just sort of sense. And I could feel that this man had a brain tumor. Of course, you don't go up to someone and say, hey, I'm sorry, you know, you think you got the flu, you got the brain tumor. So I did an exam. He had no neurological findings, but he had nausea, vomiting, fever, um, all of that, and malaise, tiredness, like the flu. So I turned to the nurse, who was this hilarious country nurse named Bubbles, with the bouffant and the red lipsticks. And I turned to Bubbles and I said, you know, I need a cat, a stat, cat scan of the head. And she said, well, Dr. Greer, he's only got the flu. And I said, just do it. Luckily, there was no HMO Nazis over my shoulder. <laughs> and my commentary on medicine, you know, a lot of people die because some bean counter says, no, you can't do this. So I just said, just do it. So I explained to him, I said, I have some concerns. I want to scan your head. It comes back. I get an emergency call back from the radiologist, and it was a pancake astrocytoma. It was a type of brain tumor that was evenly distributed on the top of the brain, pushing the brain down through the foramen magnum, 
the opening where the brainstem is, just in a way that it was hitting the chemotactic trigger zone to CTZ, which is nausea and vomiting, and the respiratory and fever and your uh, hypothalamus, the things that regulate your temperature. So it was precisely mimicking the flu. And when I handed this off to the neurosurgeon, of course he had to be you know, emergency neurosurgeon, situation in this because he was herniating his brain stem. He would have been dead in 12 hours if I'd sent him out the door. And the neurosurgeon said, how did you even think to get a CAT scan? I would never, I said, oh, I just had a hunch. So I had to really kind of cover up the fact that I could actually see and feel this, 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 this brain tumor there. And, you know, what a shame that our doctors aren't trained in the science of consciousness. Um, someday we will be. I would like to do a course. <laughs> and that for that matter, our pilots and our tech people and everyone should be. Because this ability can be universally applied and is incredibly edifying and very, very practical in reality if you kind of embrace it. Now, what we're doing here, what I'm going to lead you through is a specific application. <laughs> it's to go into quiet consciousness, become centered, be able to intend to see a remote place or sense and go into space and then turn it, if we could turn off all cell phones, particularly for the meditation, I'd appreciate it. And then vector or, or zoom in after you feel you've connected with one of these civilizations or their spacecraft or an individual, it may be a person, and then with a clear intent for the purpose of coming together as a people, not to entertain you, they're not interested in coming to be dolphins at SeaWorld for you. It's to create, you have to have a higher purpose in your ethical universe for this to work, actually. That's what they're looking for. They're looking for, are you sincere, and do you want to do this for reasons that would benefit humanity and the future of humanity and, and our relationship with these civilizations. And if you are, and you're sincere, you can't trick them, there's no tricking them, then amazing things are possible. And then you show exactly where you're located. And you just keep, you do that process over and over again. So you can imagine if you're sitting out under the stars for four or five hours doing this, all kinds of things as you saw, can happen, every kind of imaginable thing. So the key to it, though, is understanding the nature of the conscious mind and consciousness. As on, on the, simultaneously, you're awake and you're aware of yourself and your ego and your, this room, but at the same instant, you can become quiet and become aware that that same mind is omnipresent. And it's that quiet state of mind, centered and silent. So that everyone, you look around the room, look to the person next to you. Just look, the person's awake. Okay, now subtract the person's physical appearance, intellectual knowledge, emotional state, individual personality, this is very zen. And you keep subtracting. What are you left with as you look at the person? Just they're awake. And the, the awakeness, that sort of clear, aware state whereby you're looking at the room and hearing my voice, that is all it is. It's all it is. But it's experiencing it in depth. So it's, the, it's that um, transcendent state, higher state, some call it, of the conscious mind that escapes the limitations of individuality where you can then connect to that even while you are aware of yourself so it is not either or you can walk and chew gum so you can you can have a sense of this great mind while you also are aware that you have an individuality and so it begins to be something that can just phase back and forth over time Initially, you may want to just experience it in its pure state. So when you actually go into this deep and quiet state of mind and utter calmness, and it's, this is what's been called samadhi, or the beatific state in, in the Christian, early Christian era, you can go into that state and all you're experiencing is consciousness. You're not asleep, 
and you're not dreaming, but you're not perceiving any relative thing. You're not perceiving thoughts, sound, self, nothing. It's just pure consciousness. That's, you know, one experience of it. But what's important to realize is that that experience is always there. We just kind of clutter it up with all of our thoughts. Now, when we're doing this meditation, caveat number one, everyone is going to be thinking other thoughts. Nobody is like, you know, so it's natural that when you're meditating, you get distracted by this thought or you get distracted by, you know, what are you going to have for dinner or, you know, you're, you know, not comfortable in these chairs or whatever it is, whatever perception. And this is normal. The key is to not begin to tussle with the meditation process and these other thoughts and perceptions. You acknowledge them and then gently return to the meditation technique. Where most people fail in meditation is they try too hard. Really. They're trying to force out other thoughts. They're trying to force the experience. So you kind of let go and go into quietness and just let everything flow through you. And if you find yourself thinking about some other subject or some perception or some noise, let go of that and just return to the meditation technique or whatever it is you're using and go into quiet awareness. And it's this iterative process back and forth. Um, and it's gentle. It isn't kind of brute intellectual force. Does this make sense? These are really key things that I want to just before we start the process. Yeah. Now, if at some point, uh, you know, you find yourself in just a state of pure consciousness, it, just enjoy it. What you find often is that then you, you try to go to, to do something else and you try too hard. Um, it's like the, the Sufi master was trying to teach a bunch of uh, his students to levitate and walk across the water and there was this one man kvetching about the fact that he couldn't swim and he was afraid he was going to drown and on and on and on with all the sort of craziness and the, and the master turned to him and said <clears throat> leave thyself behind and then walk upon the water so there's this element of <laughs> letting yourself just calm down and leave, leave it behind so it, it's a little bit of a paradox uh, and it's a balance like riding a bicycle there's the balance of yourself and the greater self, your own awareness and the cosmic awareness. And over time, the two begin to come together so that you can easily connect to the greater consciousness even when you're doing something, driving down the road, and see over the horizon, as it were, with your mind or sense or feel. Now, it isn't all just mind and intellect or consciousness is also your heart feeling so you can feel things it's a sense of knowing that comes into play because many people will some people will receive uh, information by something quite clear like a, vi a vision or a remote view in terms of view others it's just a knowingness they just know it just pops in others it'll be very left brain with a, a, the words Others, it will be just a, a, a feeling that will then evolve into the knowing of what it is. So everyone is different. This is where the individuality comes into play, where there's this individuation, the, the, per, the individual creation, each of us, and the cosmic mind interfacing. So the way that that cosmic awareness gets translated into your own personal experience is unique. And no matter what anyone tells you, um, there's no, it's, this is not McDonald's, you know, it's like not a menu of this. And there are seven billion people, there are going to be seven billion pathways to this enlightened experience. And that's the first thing to understand. And that's why, you know, as soon as people come become really dogmatic about this or that, you know they don't know what they're talking about. <laughs> so... When you go to that state of consciousness, you begin to do it. You know, the first time you do this, this may be very strange. And it's like, you know, trying to get here. You had to go on this freeway and that thing and then the, you know, park here and where's that? And it's this whole gashrai. And you hear a voice talking on somebody's machine. Anyway, um, then if you were to do this every day, 
The second time it's easier, the fourth time it's almost automatic. By the time you came here every single day, you'd be on autopilot. Even though you're, you know, you see? So it becomes easier and easier and more natural and more effortless. So the meditation techniques and process, same thing. If you do it, and you do it in, on a regular basis, initially there may be, it seems, uh, you know, and then as you do it more and more, it becomes so easy, you can actually connect to that state of consciousness and be in that state even when you're driving down the road or in the ER or whatever you do for your living. So it becomes something that becomes part of your existence, uh, not something you have to do do just occasionally, but you have to start out with a process where you reintroduce yourself to yourself. You need to reintroduce your individuality to the unbounded aspect of, of the awake mind that allows you to be sentient. And that's where techniques help. Does that make sense? Yeah. So what I'm going to do now is do a um, technique where we'll close our eyes together and we'll do a breathing exercise and then I'll take you through uh, the breathing exercise to center and then after the breathing exercise I'll introduce a specific mantra um, that came, that's a very a beautiful one, it has three syllables and I will spell it for you although we normally never speak the mantra, it's a Vedic mantra and then we'll just quietly repeat the mantra and go into the quiet mind together. And after a period of time of meditating together, then I'll lead a meditation into the remote viewing process and to the contact process of coherent thought sequencing. So this is going to have three components. The meditative process involving the breathing technique and the mantra, followed by the expansion of awareness to view remote places and specifically in this application extraterrestrial civilizations or people or starcraft and then the third part is that once you feel you have a lock on a connection with one you may feel it then you show them where you are which means you need to then be able to show them North America California the East West Coast the Pacific Ocean, Los Angeles, the suburbs, boom, right into Glendale, which is where we are right now. Or if you're looking at the webinar in Dominican Republic. See what I mean? So that's, the, the, and then at the end of that, there'll just be silence to see what appears. And this is literally what we do out under the stars uh, all night. Beautiful process. So shall we do it? Yeah. All right. Good. So let's close our eyes. And let our awareness gently rest in the center of our forehead. And we sort of see that our two eyes and our third eye in the center of our forehead makes a triangle. You can actually feel that third eye. Now let us take some deep breaths. And we breathe in with our nose and out with our mouth. Breathe in with our nose. and out with our mouth. Over and over. And as we breathe in with our nose, we see ourselves being filled with energy, light, the prana, chi, energy of Gaia, the Mother Earth. And that light and energy spreads throughout our entire bodies. 
and we are awake, clear. And now as we exhale, each time, practice releasing all of your tensions and concerns, all limitations, all negativity. And as you exhale fully, see the breath of Mother Earth sweeping all those limitations away and you settle into the quietness of being. So now we are aware, as we begin to breathe normally, that we can just watch the breath. And our gaze is just relaxed in the center of our vision and our consciousness. And in this quiet state, we very gently introduce a thought, a sound. And in the Vedic tradition, this is called a mantra. And I'll repeat it for you a few times. I'm Nama, I'm Nama, I'm Nama, I'm Nama, I'm Nama. The first syllable is I am, M as in mother. And the second syllable is na, N A, N as in Nancy A, apple. And the third syllable is ma, M as in mother, A H. And note that the first syllable is a perfect fifth in tone higher than the second two. I'm na. I'm Nama, I'm Nama, I'm Nama, I'm Nama, I'm Nama, I'm Nama, I'm Nama. And so now, I will not speak it, for it should only be thought. And let us just gently think the mantra, repeating it. And it may be thought at any speed, loudness or softness. And it may change as we go into meditation with it. And the way we use the mantra is that we gently let our mind rest on it as it is being repeated. And it becomes a vehicle that enables us to go into deeper and quieter states of consciousness. If at any point you find yourself distracted, have thoughts or sounds, just return gently to repeating the mantra without shoving out or forcing out other thoughts, but just let them come and go. Very relaxed, very gentle process. And return to thinking the mantra. And as we do so, Gently shift to being aware of the mantra and watch the mind repeating it. Become aware of the quiet mind that has the beautiful resonance of the mantra coming and going. So let us do this for a few moments in silence together.
now, with our eyes closed, let us repeat the mantra. And we see that the mantra makes a triangle. And so the sound creates form and light. I'm not. I'm Namma, I'm Namma. And if you repeat it three times, it will make three triangles joined at the top with a triangular base. And this is called a tetrahedron. So let us see that as we gently repeat the mantra. So again, three repetitions makes a tetrahedron. I'm Namma, I'm Namma, I'm Namma. And we see this beautiful light of the tetrahedron. Now let's repeat the mantra again and create another tetrahedron joined at the base of the first one. So the two points of the tetrahedron of these two are opposite each other and the bases are joined. I'm Namma, I'm Namma, I'm Namma. And so we see this double tetrahedron and we rotate it a little bit and have the two tetrahedrons merge into each other. And it forms what's called a Merkaba, an eight-pointed star. And we let our minds rest on this beautiful form, spinning in the center of our awareness. And it is created from the tonality of the mantra making form and light, but in consciousness. And as we enter the center of this Merkaba, we allow our mind to rest. And we see it as a vehicle whereby our consciousness may explore every dimension, including time and space. And so as our minds come together now inside this Merkaba. We see this beautiful sacred geometric form expanding. And with each breath we see this Merkaba growing. And so now it envelops this entire auditorium and all of us, our awareness is within it but we perceive the quiet mind whereby each of us are conscious. And so at once we are many and at once we are one. And in this state of quiet oneness, we allow ourselves to expand the sense of consciousness, awareness, as we travel in this Merkaba. And so it expands now to include this entire campus. And our awareness expands with it. And we float upward into the sky above Glendale. Effortlessly, we just float. And we gaze with consciousness and look down on the campus and at the Los Angeles area. And to the west, we see the ocean to the east, the hills, and the mountains. And we become aware that the earth herself is awake and conscious, and is a conscious being, and is in fact female. And she joins us in this beautiful meditation. And so now we rise into Father Sky, and we behold Father Sky embracing Mother Earth. And when the two came together, we, her children, 
performed. And so we behold the beauty of space as we float effortlessly. We acknowledge the conscious mind is omnipresent. And while we are individuals, the light of awareness whereby we are awake is always and eternally infinite within us, boundless. And so we rise effortlessly then higher outside the stratosphere and the atmosphere of earth. And now we see the whole globe of the earth. How beautiful. And in our consciousness within the Merkaba, we expand and see the moon. And then expand further into our solar system. And we see the sun in the center of our solar system. And Mercury and Venus and Earth and Mars. And the outer planets, how beautiful Saturn with the rings. And Jupiter. And we see all of this is actually pure consciousness resonating, phasing as planets and light and space and time. And in reality, all that our mind perceives is the conscious being appearing as that thing. And we become aware that space is not empty, but is in fact unbounded cosmic consciousness. And awestruck, we gaze then around the vastness of the universe. But we realize that this cosmic mind is the same consciousness whereby each of us are awake. And that same light of conscious being is illuminating the window of each of our souls. And we become aware that this is an infinite light, unbounded, pure consciousness. And thus we expand into interstellar space. And we become aware first of Alpha Centauri, the closest star, and Sirius and Arcturus. But then we become aware of the vast spiral of the Milky Way galaxy floating within the vastness of space with 100 billion star systems. And every stable star system has planets with beings who are conscious, just as we are. And we realize that the universe is teeming with life. And now we expand into intergalactic space and we see the twin galaxy of Andromeda, very similar to the Milky Way, also with a hundred billion star systems or so. And we expand our awareness so that both the Milky Way and Andromeda are within our awareness and inside this beautiful Merkaba. Cosmic consciousness. And then, without effort, in one breath, we expand this consciousness to include all of space and time which has no beginning or end. And then we go beyond space and time into the worlds of light. And we see vast worlds that are purely of the astral energy and of the thought realm. And at the finest level, the celestial, transcendent. And then we can behold the quiet, unbounded being. And all that exists in creation is continuously pouring forth from this infinite, quiet, changeless, conscious self.
And so in this state, our hearts are filled with joy and love and awe at how beautiful existence is. And we allow our minds and our hearts to draw us to any place where there is intelligent life capable of coming to earth. And without preconceptions or prejudice, we just allow our minds to go and our hearts to be drawn. And if at some point we see a person, a planet, a starship, wherever it may be in the cosmos, we connect to them in this state of pure consciousness. And as we gaze into the eyes of these beings or feel their existence, we see they are awake, even as we are conscious. And that consciousness is a singularity. And we are all one people in one universe. And we acknowledge our oneness. And in that state, as ambassadors and as children of Earth, we invite them here. So as we begin to sense these intelligences, we connect to them in any way that we are comfortable, seeing them as they are. And those that reside on other planetary systems that have mastered interstellar transdimensional travel, we connect to them personally and to their guidance system, which interfaces with coherent, clear thought and intention. And as we connect to them, we show them our planet. Without straining, we see our galaxy again. And then on the outer spiral arms of the Milky Way, the star system we call our sun. And then the third planet from the sun, Earth. And as we zoom into Earth, we feel the great joy of the love of Mother Earth and the beauty, the jewel that she is in the diadem of creation. And then we see North America. And as we draw nearer, we show them the coast of California. And coming into the vast Los Angeles area, coming east and inland from the ocean, we show them the town of Glendale and this campus and this place. And if you were in another location, in another country or continent, you do the same. And you just guide them in effortlessly with clear thought and intention. And in this way, we invite them to appear in any way it is safe and appropriate for this time and place in this group. And without expectation or prejudice, we invite them here in universal peace as the children of Earth and ambassadors to the universe. So let us be in silence for a few minutes practicing this. And we can breathe and think the mantra Become aware of quiet mind. Expand awareness and intend to see what is beyond the physical senses. And with consciousness, travel free throughout the cosmos. And as we see these intelligent life forms and their worlds or their starships, we connect to them in peace, with transcendent love, 
and the oneness of cosmic awareness. And then we show them where we are located. And we invite them in any way that they choose to appear and manifest, whether it is in 3D, electronically, in light, in matter, in tone. So let us be silent and practice this for just a few moments. Now, knowing that we can do this for a very long time in silence together, but today we just return to where we are, but gently become aware of the room or wherever it is you're located, but stay connected to this pure state of consciousness. And know that the wake mind, consciousness, whereby each of us have our being, is always infinite, omnipresent, boundless within us. And whensoever we choose, we may connect to that universal field of awake mind. And we may see any place we intend to see and know anything we wish to know and accomplish whatever it is we wish to accomplish as we come together and work to create a time of universal peace and enlightenment on earth. Namaste. We can open our eyes when you're ready. So that is an introduction to what can be done. I hope you had a good journey. And we have on the app and also a training kit that goes through all this so you can practice it whenever you wish. The key aspects of it are to recognize that the mind can center and using either the mantra or a breathing technique or if you have something else that works better for you. But go into quiet mind and at the point that you become aware that you are deeply centered and quiet, intend to expand the awareness and see wherever you wish. So you can reduce this process to a few seconds. You can connect, expand, see. I call this rapid access remote viewing. In other words, the process I went through, which is actually an abbreviated process of what I do each night under the stars when I treat people, use that process is about an hour, um, which we don't have time here today to do. But you can actually collapse it, if you wish, once you practice it often, into this ability to go very quickly into the sense of non-local expanded mind, see remote places, connect to the ETs or whatever it is you wish to connect to, and show them where you are. So you can actually do it within seconds to moments with practice. 
Now again, everything is um, the science of consciousness and the art of consciousness is a science and an art and, and requires some discipline. But you'll be very surprised if you do this with any sincerity how rapidly you begin to develop that ability with or without the ET connection. But if you do it as for this purpose of contacting interstellar civilizations, uh, you're going to be stunned at how quickly they will respond. Why? Well, here's a news flash. The State Department of the United States and Hillary Clinton weren't doing this for the U.S. government. We are. And I'm not trying to be cheeky. The people of the world have got to understand that authority figures and governmental structures and powers, they have opted out of dealing with this. There's a covert program that is militaristic and really very deleterious to our future that has seized it. Where does that leave us? On the one hand, you have passivity. On the other hand, you have, frankly, a malignant tendency. And that's where the power of we the people come in. Because if we the people decide, oh, okay, the government's not acting, and it's unlikely any president is going to do much with this until we do it and lead the way. I've always said, even in the early days before the Disclosure Project, if the people will lead, the leaders will follow. Why? Because they'll have to. They're not going to do it because it's something they're going to step out into something that's controversial or something that's going to step on the toes of the $700 trillion oil, gas, coal, and petrodollar system. They're going to do it because they have to. So this ties together sort of full circle for a moment how disclosure happens. It's not just disclosing and getting people who are top secret folks to come forward, although I am now calling for a mass civil disobedience, cosmic civil disobedience by those people. What do I mean by that? Up here in the high desert of California, there's something called the CUBE, C-U-B-E, which is a Lockheed Martin underground facility. I know people who have worked in it. And there are people who deal with these interstellar technologies and transdimensional electronics and all this stuff up near Lancaster and Palmdale and Edwards Range. Now, what we really need to have is a whole lot of those folks defecting massively from the illegal secrecy that they're bound under. Same thing with the Dugway facility near Provo. Same thing with the Dulce facility. Same thing with Pine Gap. Same thing with the compartmented operations within the CIA. Now there are a lot of people I've worked with who are in these projects and they don't want to do it out of fear. But if they do it together in this next wave of disclosure, it would be safe if they would come together. So I'm putting out a call now and over the internet that those people do so and they can contact me if they are in such a position and we will organize another massive disclosure event. That's one way. The other way is that the people do this and make contact. Why? Because as we make contact in thousands of teams all over the world, which we now have, and which there will be more after this, I hope. There's no way they can contain that. Yes, the intelligence community can track where I go, and if I'm doing something with the law, but they can't track where thousands of people, they don't have infinite assets. And even if they know what you're doing, they can't deploy assets to suppress the ETs from appearing. Now, when you do this, you do it with the knowledge that you ask the ETs to appear in any way it's safe and for that time and place. What you don't want to do is create this circus where you say it's a dolphin in SeaWorld jumping through your hoops and they're kind of puppets on your string. And first of all, that's demeaning, but secondly, it's dangerous. We did this, we had one of these experiences at Mount Shasta, back 2004, about 10 years ago, 10 and a half years ago. 
and there was one of those, that, like that light ship you saw that lifted up and flew out. Well, one came from the volcano and came towards us, and it wasn't just staying by the volcano, it was floating our way. And I was with about 40 people, 30 or 40 people. I don't do it with big groups like that anymore. 25's the cutoff, it's too much for me. Um, and this high flying, what looked like a jumbo jet, moved in and released a um, scalar electromagnetic pulse that literally crashed into the woods in front of us, ripping the tree limbs off and went into the earth so crazily it went oh, 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 shook the whole earth for 15 seconds now everyone saw this luckily this craft this light ship vanished an instant before this thing was deployed now the reason i point this out is that we do this with the knowledge that the ets want to make contact but they do so within a world that's unfortunately an armed camp and until we get that under control we have to accept that they may appear in all manner of strange ways. They may materialize, they may not. They may come in, uh, you know how one of the, uh, the most amazing people in our team is, uh, we, or some friends of mine who, uh, dear friends now, but I didn't know them at the time, um, Marilyn and, and um, her, her wife Diane in upstate New York and outside Albany, and one of them, can't remember which one. They had a smartphone, and not an i. It was a, not an iPhone, and they had read Hidden Truth, Forbidden Knowledge, and suddenly on their smartphone, an ET sphere ship started appearing, just spontaneously, and would appear and disappear. She went to the dentist just on a routine appointment, and suddenly, the inside the dentist's office, th this sphere appeared on her phone and then the CSETI tones that are on the app and in the training material started beeping, beep, 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 all through the PA system. It overrode the Muzak in the dentist's office and the dentist came running out and saying, what in the world's going on? It sounds like the mothership is landing. <laughs> and finally, you know, Diane and Marilyn said, we've got to go to one of these expeditions with Dr. Greer and they came to the Outer Banks where you saw what happened. So if you open this up, now so there's all kinds of strange ways that these interstellar transdimensional civilizations will contact you. But don't get rigid in what you're expecting because anything is possible and full materialized craft are and they can land. But they'd have to slip through and do it at a point in time and space where there's not the risk of being targeted, which unfortunately is the case. A lot of the work I do when I go to meetings at the CIA and, and Pentagon is to beg them to stop these programs. But most of the people you meet with don't know about them. So, for example, the head of the Defense Intelligence Agency, which is like the CIA for the Pentagon, it's a huge, he didn't know. And when he asked about the issue, the only thing he was given was a little ET, plastic ET doll and someone making fun of him. Same thing with the head of intelligence for the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Same thing for the president and same thing for John Podesta, who, as you know, recently left the White House and tweeted his big regret was that he couldn't affect UFO disclosure. This is the senior counsel to the president of the United States. So what you have to realize is that this has now landed squarely in the lap of who? No, not me. <laughs> we, the, all of us together. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> no, that, don't do that. <laughs> I'm, getting, I'm getting long in the tooth and old. But, it, no, it's in the hands of all of us. Which, interestingly, I think is where it should be. Because, in reality, while we should expect our leaders, and I'm very, of course, pro-disclosure from official governments to do this, you have to understand that the President of the United States as Jimmy Carter said, is the last to know about anything important like this. You know, uh, President Carter was at a guitar signing ceremony in Spain with a, a friend of uh, the project, a uh, very famous classical guitarist, and he was signing guitars 
um, and then uh, to be auctioned off with the Carter Center. And afterwards, there was a dinner with the f maybe 20, 25 people. And someone asked the president, how is it, to, how, what is it like to be the most powerful man in the world? And President Carter said, well, I don't think I was that man. And you could have heard a pin drop. And they said, what do you mean? He said, well, there are things that I couldn't find out about and they wouldn't tell me about. And someone rather derisively in a ridiculing way, say, yeah, like what, UFOs? And President Carter said, yes, that and more. So that is true. So, you, you know, when you look at the presidential daily briefing and what the CIA director puts together, most of it is stuff dealing with rather conventional issues. Um, this issue rarely gets briefed, and when it does, it's very cursory and in a way that's meant to manipulate. In other words, Ronald Reagan, Reagan, your governor, he was, I know the colonel who set up the briefings for SDI for him, the Strategic Defense Initiative, Star Wars. And he, they said, yes, we introduced the alien threat to Reagan so that he would support SDI. Okay, and that's why he went to the UN. You know the famous speech where he said, wouldn't our job of creating world peace be easier if we had a common alien threat to unite against? So he got brain, they told him just enough information to play him like a pawn. That's how it works. So we have to be wiser than that, although most ufologists aren't. We have to be the people who are in the vanguard of interstellar contact and peace that goes beyond the sort of narrative of us versus them and good versus bad and Les Creek cowboys and Indians in space. Because that era belongs to the Yuga, the Kali Yuga, this last 400,000 some year, the so-called Adamic cycle that's closing. There's a new cycle that's opening, that's half a million years. So we have to say, okay, all that stuff belongs in our rear view mirror. Let's create a world of lasting universal peace, cosmic consciousness, and the ability for everyone on Earth to be born into a planet that is pristine, without pollution, without poverty, that is just. This is something we can do in this generation. I doubt it's going to be the president. I doubt it's going to be Congress. I doubt it's going to be the prime minister of some country. They will join in after we, the people, create enough motion that it becomes an inevitability. Now, that's why I say that disclosure, contact, bringing up these technologies that we haven't talked about today, that have been around for 100 years, that are free energy type technologies, that rests with us. I doubt it's going to come out of Lockheed, and I doubt it's going to come out of the White House or Congress. I meet with these folks. Number one, the way that this subject was first kept secret was through a coup d'etat after the Rockefeller Commission, Nelson Rockefeller, Lawrence, who I knew, Lawrence Rockefeller's brother, reorganized the Department of Defense and the CIA in such a way that no president could penetrate what the hell they're doing. These are the unacknowledged special access projects. Secondly, it became something that was so ridiculed that if you were a respectable person, a scientist, a professor, a government official, a politician, a doctor, you wouldn't touch this subject because the CIA in 1953 in a document I have said we are going to use this for its psychological warfare value and engage Disney Studios here in LA, which they did, to make cartoons about little green men and flying saucers. And anything that breaks into the news, our acolytes within the media will be told not to cover it and will be sure it gets placed where? On the front page of the National Enquirer. So it would be the stuff of nonsense. That was done deliberately, which has made the subject topic non grata in polite circles. It's all brainwashing. It's all propaganda, but it's been very effective. For this and other reason, it's unlikely that the centers of power are going to do disclosure and are going to do free energy and are going to do contact openly. And in that vacuum, what stepped in since the 1950s? Murder Incorporated. No, the people running these projects covertly have taken over those interests. 
and hijack them from the people and from the people's representatives, which has scared the hell out of the people I briefed in Washington, including the CIA director and the Senate Intelligence Committee members. They know this stuff is real. They know they don't have access control. Now, access control means you know about it and you can access and control the projects. That's the nature of an unacknowledged special access project, which we are spending $100 billion to $200 billion a year just in the United States on these illegal operations. So that is such a mess that you're not... I'm not saying that it can't happen from the centers of power. I'm saying it will happen after we create it as an inevitable force from disclosing the information ourselves, making contact, and perchance at the right moment, enough people do this and a morphogenic field is created where the ETs come through massively. And they won't do it until we're ready. Why? Because they don't want to play into the hands of an invasion scenario. I want to say something here about those. You know, this is Larry King. Everyone, everyone who's ever interviewed asked me, why don't they land on the White House lawn? <laughs> or over a Super Bowl game? <laughs> well, first of all, are you a moron? But no, I mean, I'm sorry. First of all, if that were to start to happen, aside from probably being blown out of the sky, unless they shut down our weapon systems, they, it would be used by these folks who are demagogues and the alien invasion crowd to say we're being invaded by, like Independence Day the movie, aliens. So that kind of an event, that's a very frontal event, could be spun in the very direction that they're trying to avoid. Which is why the events have to be CE5, cooperative, open, and tuned finally to the time that we're in. And this is where, uh, the, I don't know if folks really understand how much power we have as individuals and also what responsibility we have. I'll never forget 1992 after we had this event happen in Florida that made it into the press and Murder Incorporated, I call them politely, came after me. Um, <laughs> this is one of my terms for this majestic group. And afterwards, there was a countess, um, uh, a lady in the United Kingdom who was there, who was friends with some of these people. And she said, you know what? They're very jealous of you. I said, what? Why? And she was talking about the former head of Army Intelligence and these NSA. She says, because they're in a box. They're in a prison. And they're lifers. You're free. You can do what you want. And even though they really hate my guts, they really envy us. So I want to, you know, even Truman and later President Clinton said that the White House is the crown jewel of the federal penitentiary system. And it, there's more truth to that than you can imagine. We, who are, I always tell people, I'm very happy to be a nobody. And I've been called every name in the book. So I'm very happy just to be an ordinary person without any temporal power or position and no authority in any official circles to just sort of be the cosmic Johnny Appleseed <laughs> you know, spreading this information and each of you can do the same. So if each of you left here and formed a contact team and ended up being hundreds of new CE5 contact teams, that would enliven this morphogenic field that potentiates and manifests that good future. Because we're, that's what we're seeing. That's what we're manifesting. So we actually manifest the world of our dreams. Does that make sense? Yeah. That's it. So um, I want to go through. Uh, that, that was sort of my sort of wrap up of of what I wanted to share in these few hours we have together. There's another uh, a few questions I want to get to. And um, I know that we're not going to get to like there are a few hundred that have come in, but I'll, I'll just go through the ones that I can uh, in the time we have left. Um, someone from Las Vegas asked, uh, what is your ultimate goal for CE5 and do you see it as the best method for full disclosure? Exactly what we're talking about. It is the best method. And 
My goal is that we're going to get this to the point where we'll begin to organize live mass CE5 events globally, all happening simultaneously. All right, that's the next step. Because these guys, no matter how powerful they are, they can't be everywhere at once, right? And they have a lot of assets. They don't have infinite assets. Another question from this city. How do the experiences in your CE5 contacts in your video before the break differ from the uh, man-made Lockheed Martin experiences? Well, again, the, the, the man-made devices have a machine feel. And I'm going to go here to, into another thing that's going to be, we could talk all night about. The ET craft, the, one, the people who got to the Roswell crash, or the man I know who got to the original crash that happened in the Andes on the Bolivian-Peruvian border in 1992, one of our disclosure project witnesses, Every single one of the people I know who've been at these sites have said that the craft themselves were trying to heal themselves. And they are living, conscious nano-bio machines. What do I mean? The spacecraft themselves, aside from being seamless and having an energy that is very trans-dimensional, are conscious and living, and they're conscious to the point of AI, artificial intelligence, to the point you can feel that the craft itself is transmitting and has the consciousness of the pilot or the occupants. How many people have had that experience? I bet a few have. So that is very different from a machine made by Lockheed and Northrop or what have you. And so there are certain hallmarks like that that is quite obvious, especially on a close encounter or close approach versus the man-made ones. The man-made ones feel like a man-made machine, and um, they are. And they're not nearly as sophisticated as the bio-nano-conscious ET craft, um, which are themselves conscious. Now, I want to say something all about that also. Some of these civilizations are so far advanced that the spacecraft themselves contain the full consciousness of the occupants up to and including cosmic consciousness and God consciousness. They're amazing. Yeah, those encounters are beautiful. We don't have time to go through it. Now here's a question from Huntington Beach. Does group contact also serve to download higher consciousness into collective human consciousness to accelerate the rate of awakening? Yes, there is a power to doing this. You know, there's a saying, God loves those who work together. Um, there is an enormous power to people doing this in a group. Now, I'm not saying you can't do this by yourself, but if you do it in a group, and I'm not a huge group, but you know, three to eight people is enough. Um, there is a coherence that happens, and like Dr. John found at Princeton, it's an exponential growth. But now imagine if we begin to organize thousands of people in thousands of teams all over the world doing this, the shift it can have in global consciousness, even by people who don't know what we're doing. Um, because it will affect literally every atom and subatomic particle on Earth. That's the power of higher consciousness. Um, we have a question. Can you speak to the common knowledge among uh, indigenous people of multidimensional beings? Uh, I began having contact experience in my teens with Plei those from the Pleiades who I later found out my tribe descends from. Very good question. Actually, the native peoples that I've met with and a lot of the chiefs have told me that the, uh, they view them as star people, but I, my, uh, man, I have a quarter Cherokee Indian through my father and uh, an eighth of uh, Catawba Indian through my mother. And I know that amongst the Cherokee, they were, felt that they were from people from the Pleiades. Now, I think probably what actually happened is not like all these different tribes on Earth came literally from another star system, but they had contact with beings from that star, those star systems that gave them knowledge and insight. The Dagon tribe in Africa, uh, has an account actually had a star chart that identified that Sirius was actually two stars, Sirius A and B, et cetera, and so on. Many of you know this. And so the native peoples, when you go around the world, you will find that there is in their tradition, although they tend not to speak of it for fear of ridicule, um, 
about the fact that they have had contact with these civilizations. It is my own sense that every culture uh, in ancient times up through modern times have had contact experiences that have informed their society. And if you look at even in the uh, Middle Age, in the, I think the 1400s, there was a, a painting, it's on our website, and I've seen the real one actually, that's in Italy, of uh, Mary, Mother Mary, holding baby Jesus. She has a star on her left shoulder, and above her is a ship that looks exactly like the craft that we saw in Florida, in, in Pensacola, exactly, with a beam of bluish light coming down with people underneath it looking up like this. And that's been authenticated. That is something from the 1400s. So if you go through the history of the human race, native peoples, western cultures, Celtic societies, all have had some sort of contact. Um, that has informed their myths and their traditions. Now, many times the meaning of it gets distorted over time, but it certainly has happened. And most Native peoples, if you talk to their elders, they know this, certainly the Hopis, the Cherokee, others. Another one from the Dominican Republic. Um, once you have made contact, what do you do with that information and what is the key message for humanity behind all this? <laughs> Very good question. Um, you know, there's a wonderful saying, the wise are they who speak not unless they have a hearer. So there are a lot of things we can experience that we have to use, to, you know, common sense as to what we share it with. But I think to the extent that we can share things with people who are open to the knowledge, it's very important because ultimately to make this subject real we need to have a lot of people understand what its implications are and the implications are enormous for the human future and I recommend that everyone think about when you have an experience that who it is that you can share this with that you feel safe in doing so but also to think about what it is that you should say to people who may not be wanting to hear the high strangeness part of this. Um, and that's why we put together the disclosure book, the DVDs that have, we have a two hour and a four hour DVD that has all these military witnesses, documents, et cetera, photos, because some people really need to start at where they are. Everyone does. You don't want to speak past people. But I think it's to the extent that you can speak of these experiences with like-minded and open-minded people, it will spread the knowledge person to person very, very quickly. But the real message the ETs are sending through the CE5 contact, the meta message, in my opinion, is that we are ready and we're waiting for you to be ready. So if, if we show them we're ready for contact by doing something intelligent, without prejudice, that's looking into the future in a beautiful way, they're going to respond in, in ways that are really almost magically beautiful. But we have to, we're, they're waiting for us to make that initiative because we're the children of Earth. They just don't want to come here and obviously, uh, you know, disrupt things. I mean, could they come to Earth, shut down all military systems <clears throat> and impose some sort of new world here? Yeah, sure. It'd be about as successful as us trying to put in a Jeffersonian democracy in Afghanistan. Okay, so, so look, you know, if we figure this out, you know they have. They're wiser than that. It has to come through us. We're the children of Earth. One question from uh, Bakersfield. Any evidence that the transdimensional ETs are us from our future who have physically and spiritually evolved? Yes and no. Most are interstellars that have originated and evolved from other star systems. But there are experiences that are exactly what this gentleman is asking. To wit. Everybody heard of the Rendlesham Forest Bentwaters case? Famous landing event at a secret nuclear facility in England in 81, I believe. We have a number of disclosure project witnesses. 
and a craft came down. It was shaped like a pyramid, broke some branches as it came down, left physical traces. The Ministry of Defense in Great Britain eventually released them. Lord Hill Norton, who I met with and spent some time with, who had been Minister of Defense, uh, was appalled that he was lied to about all these things when he was in those positions. But what the story you haven't heard is that some of the officers I've gotten to know who don't want to go on the record saying this for fear of ridicule related that when on one particular night, now this happened over many, many days, a month or two, but on this one particular night an object landed and they went out and it was a perfect pyramid, so four triangular sides and a square base, right? A tetrahedron is three triangular sides and a triangular base. A lot of people com com confuse the two. The pyramid landed and out through, it was like black onyx, it was like glass black but kind of translucent and out was a very tall luminous light beam that floated through the side of the craft and communicated with the officers and said we are you from the future we are your descendants from 500,000 years in the future and if you don't stop what you're doing here we won't be and it was a warning about the nuclearization of the planet and the risks of mutual assured destruction and global holocaust. And people say, what? It sounds like something out of a science fiction movie. So on the one hand, they were ETs, but they were us. They were ETs that had been humans that had gone through half a million years of conscious evolution to where those who are the descendants of us on Earth had become extraterrestrials. And that's what landed at Rendl Rendlesham Forest, Bent Waters. Get it? Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Well, okay. <laughs> A lot of people go, what? Yeah, we could spend two months and I wouldn't exhaust this information about what that means. Um, someone from Seattle. Will you talk a little more about the depth of multi-dimensional layers? A really good question. We tried to organize these in sort of insightful questions. Um, so when you talk about, everybody remember the old radios that had the, you could turn them on a knob and you could, sometimes you'd hear one station and sometimes you'd hear another station in Chicago. And if you got it just right, you could hear both stations. Okay, that's what we're talking about. You can have these technologies to where uh, the trans-dimensional physics would be that they can be here in this time and place and simultaneously be in another dimension or another time or another place. Because you can dissociate time from space. And it gets, this gets too complex to go into in terms of the physics of it. But time can be dissociated from 3D space and trans-dimensional physics allow, for example, a craft to be over Los Angeles, simultaneously be out in another star system, and also the same craft and beings be outside Seattle. That happened during the Northridge earthquake. The famous actor Burl Ives, who was, you know, got on a hot tin roof and was friends with Elizabeth Taylor, I was at his home and his wife told me during the Northridge earthquake, she had an ET experience after I had taught her these protocols. And the north, she was up in Anacortes, north of Seattle. And this craft, early in the morning, wee hours, was hovering over her driveway. And a blue beam sort of light was coming into her foyer. And there was a thought being transmitted to her that said, do not be concerned, do not be afraid. We are always with you, you will be safe. She picked up the phone and intuitively knew to call her best friend who lived in Los Angeles. At that instant, that woman was in the throes of the Northridge earthquake with the, her house shaking, saying, Dorothy, you wouldn't believe what's going on. There's a terrible earthquake going on, but there's this craft. And she described precisely the same craft and the same message streaming from this trans-dimensional light. And she was getting the same words over and over again. Do not be afraid, we are always with you, et cetera, and so on. And Dorothy asked me, was that the same craft in two places? I said, yes, it's called bilocation. You can bilocate, trilocate, quadrilocate. So 
when you begin to understand the plasticity of space-time and how much it's linked into consciousness and the science of consciousness and the realms of astral energy, but there are interfaces where the world of thought and consciousness begins to resonate into finer and finer connections into the structure of space-time. And so space-time becomes flexible. Not only can you bend it, but you can cause objects to appear in multiple places at once. I don't know if I caused more confusion than help on that question. But it's a very, very important thing to know because it means that the transdimensional sciences have a corollary in human conscious evolution. Because if you read the stories of the masters of the East and the ancient masters and yogis, you will see that they could bilocate, trilocate, they could go through things. Everything that you read about that these ET craft are doing, humans have done innately with our own hardware and software. So these advanced civilizations have simply taking, taken that knowledge and turned it into systems that can be done scientifically. So anything that can be done in consciousness can be done technologically and, any, and vice versa. So this gets into this deep analysis of conscious assisted technology, consciousness assisted technologies, and technology assisting consciousness. Does that make sense? But the technologies develop to such a point that all those uh, experiences are, po are possible. I think I'll take one more question, and I'm a few minutes late, but we started a few minutes late. Is that all right? Have your teams had actual dialogue experiences and received messages with the ETs? And do you have advice to CE5 ambassadors about directed dialogues with the ETs? Yes, uh, uh, we have. And if you, the last chapter of the book, um, Extraterrestrial Contact, Countdown to Transformation, is a translation of those Orion transmissions. But what happens is that you're in a state of quiet mind and you start getting very specific information. And it's, people say, oh, is that channeling? I said, no, it's not channeling, because you're simply accessing the information from these intelligences and making sense of it. Now, it's very subjective. So I always tell people, this is an impression we have. You can't be bombastic and you know, create a catechism around any of that. But at the same time, you have to recognize that the technologies allow for uh, sort of a really advanced version of what we would call a neurophone. In other words, uh, technologies that transmit thought and information directly to people's consciousness. And th they can do that. And so what we do is receive that information and then continue the dialogue. And that's how I found out that Bijou, that one that was floating in the desert out in Joshua Tree, was actually from the Andromeda galaxy, et cetera, and so on. Now that was my impression, maybe I'm completely wrong. But you do this enough and then you ask through these electronic systems we keep on site that are very inexpensive, these tri-field meters and battery operated radar detectors for them to confirm two beeps yes, one beep no, or something like that. And they'll do it. I mean, it sounds strange, but you, know, you use what you've got. And it actually is very simple and it does work. So you can get into sort of a dialogue and then repeat it verbally and then use those detectors uh, to confirm or deny, sort of an affirmation or denial. And that's what we do. We do it for hours. Does that make sense? Yeah? Well, I would really like to thank all of you for your support and time in coming here. Thank you. This encounter, the third kind, you all know from Steven Spielberg's movie, is when it involves the sighting of or involvement with a, uh, an extraterrestrial uh, biological uh, or living being being seen. The close encounter of the fourth kind is when someone has an experience and they contact, they're contacted and they're taken on board a craft. But a close encounter of the fifth kind is when humans deliberately make contact and invite them to come. Very important distinction because it's the first category that involves human initiated and cooperative contact. And so Dr. Haynes at NASA Ames Research Center wrote a compilation uh, of cases that I had started in a book called Close Encounters of the Fifth Kind. The term Close Encounters of the Fifth Kind, or CE5, was one that I sort of coined in, in 1990. Or 
oh, oh, if it could move to the right, I could see it better, and it moves to the right or move to the left, where it would be the person wouldn't be speaking it verbally, but just thinking, but in a directed intent way, a very clear way, and the ET craft <clears throat> would respond. And there's a whole category of these uh, and a collection of them that exist that are uh, mentally actuated CE5s as opposed to light signaling or what have you. <clears throat> Those are the ones that really got my interest. that uh, followed on to what happened to me when I was 18 years old and I was up in the mountains of North Carolina at the uh, far tower. Now they call it far tower, it's a fire tower. But in the mountains of North Carolina, they call it far tower. So, so the far tower experience was, um, uh, I'm from North Carolina so I can make fun of it. Uh, you can't. Anyway. <laughs> you Yankees, I'm just joking. <clears throat> but this was a really amazing experience because it was all based on the fact that the ETs were interested in a guy who was experiencing the Samadhi. And <clears throat> there's more to the story than I'm related. It's a very long story. But the key component of it was that I got the message was it could have been anybody, but they were interested in hum a human and experiencing that state of consciousness who could become clear and centered and then go into that state and intend to see distant places and it works and it was just this ordinary guy that you would see anywhere and I, I tell that story only to emphasize that people get into a sort of a a shtick about these things you know a certain way you dress and a certain way you look and you've got to have this thing and that thing. Well, you know, here's the truth. We have a guy who wrote to us recently in Croatia who's a truck driver who is practicing the, the meditation at a rest when he was along a remote area and went into that state, centered quiet consciousness, did the deep meditation, and then re did the remote viewing of space and the area and just sent a call out to the ETs and showed them, zoomed in on where he was, like a GPS. And within a few minutes, this craft materialized and floated over his truck. And he wrote in about this, and he was a truck driver. So I, I, sort of, I totally reject this idea that somehow um, what I'm about to share and take you through this process uh, as an introductory uh, teaching experience it's something that so-and-so can do, but I can't. You see what I mean? Because, and, and it's really important for people to own their own power. Because if you say you can't do something, you won't. I don't care what it is. I mean, if I were to tell myself as a doctor, I really can't do a, a, a tracheal cut down. And, you know, because someone's larynx, the voice box is crushed. And I'm there convincing myself I can't, I couldn't. So anything you do in life, if you go into it with the attitude of a negative a little gremlin on your shoulder saying, oh, I can't do this, but so-and-so can, you're going to convince yourself you can't and you won't. So, you know, the old saying, as ye have faith, so shall your powers and blessings be. So in other words, if you have, and it's not faith in something that's like a belief system, but if you have the positive confidence that something can happen, it, it will happen. But if you convince yourself it can't happen, it won't. So the mind is a very powerful thing. And I would say that before we start this, just to kind of understand in the future how it could be used. This may have started earlier, because I had a sighting, daytime sighting, like the disc we were showing earlier, um, when I was about eight or nine, which was followed by me having a lot of lucid dreams with these creatures that kind of freaked me out because I was a little kid and I would <clears throat> find myself in you know waking up under the bed kind of like but I realized that these civilizations were with us all the time if we'd open to them and between the ages of I'd say 8 and 12 I was really interested in the subject I mean it was back of course in 
in the 60s. And um, it was a period when, believe it or not, there were you know, magazines like Argosy and Life and other magazines that would have it on the cover. Major sightings, major events. <clears throat> and I began to collect all these and think, oh, wow, this is so, and I was almost obsessed. Until I went into adolescence, sort of found, you know, forgot about it all. Until I had this experience happen six months after the near-death experience. The consciousness experience that happened showed me that the mind that allows each of us to be awake is always tied into this cosmic consciousness. We just choose not to connect to it um, for whatever reason. But we can, as easily as we've sh shut that off, we can open the cage, as it were, and let our, the bird of our soul fly through this higher consciousness and higher spirit. Um, it takes some discipline and some effort, and doing it on a regular basis helps if you're doing a use of the meditation approach. But I feel that the main thing that people have to first accept is that this is something everyone's birthright is that they can experience the fullness of their cosmic multi-dimensional self. There's a man, many of you may have heard his name, named Ingo Swan, and he was a friend of mine before he passed away. And I was once with him up at his um, apartment up in New York, and we were talking about this. And he was a very renowned remote viewer who, much to his later regret, got involved with uh, military intelligence and the DARPA programs and Stanford Research International and other entities. But he and I were talking about this and that, you know, one of the, the problems is that people think that this is a, some sort of a special ability that only certain people have. Then that's completely wrong. It's an ability that certain people give themselves in an imaginative way and make the effort to develop. And, you know, Paramahansa Yogananda said that it's because of the lack of spiritual adventuresomeness and because of spiritual lassitude that people don't have more of these gifts and more of these, what are in the Vedas, called cities, S-I-D-D-H-I-S, these abilities and powers. So it's really latent within every single human, but also every single sentient being. Because if we're dealing with higher intelligence, in other words, not microbes from another star system, but civilizations that are in starships, they're conscious, and they have conscious intelligence. And guess what? Whatever it is that they've developed, we can develop. Or whatever humans have experienced in the most enlightened person on Earth, these civilizations can also experience. Because it's all folded, and this is where it's truly egalitarian and de democratic, the universe is placed within the structure of conscious awareness, the completeness of that experience that can unfold and unfold and unfold and unfold for everyone, everyone who's a conscious sentient being. I remember some years ago there was a, a man named um, <clears throat> Art Bell who had a radio show on uh, co something called Coast to Coast, and I used to be on his show periodically, and um, some of you may have heard of it, and he had a contest once to see who could remote view something he had put on his refrigerator. Well, with, you know, just stuck a something on his refrigerator with a magnet. And that he was seeing if anyone could actually go into this state of consciousness and do it. And a man called up and saw precisely what it was. And it was a CSETI member from San Diego who was a uh, I think a land surveyor and tidal examiner, just sort of a salt of the earth guy that you'd see, you know, you'd have a beer with. I mean, he was not like he was some, he was an Ingo Swan. <laughs> and Art Bell said, how in the world did you do this? He says, well, I, you know, I went to this training thing with Dr. Greer and learned just to do this where I Since 1995, over 26,000 international students from all walks of life joined the British investigators training courses in anomalous phenomena the only courses of their kind. Constructed by the world's leading academics and brilliant minds within ufology, paranormal and supernatural, parapsychological study, anomalous phenomena, science, hypnotherapy, spiritualism, astrology, 
astronomy, cryptozoology and many other areas. Our certified self-study courses will teach you how to assess, analyze, engage, formulate, document and be cognizant of all types of phenomena. Suitable for light workers and star seeds, curious personalities and inquisitive minds, skeptics alike and truth seekers. For more information, please visit www.stellaruniversity.com. Thank you for being punctual. I know we didn't. We don't want to take too long, much time. It's a, it's a 4:32. So um, we're going to go till six, right? Maybe we'd go longer, but we need to be out of here around 6. And then afterwards, we'll be outside and we can just talk and visit. <clears throat> if you brought books, I'm happy to sign them or whatever. Um, but the auditorium, they want us out a little after 6. So this next section, what I really want to focus on is the techniques in consciousness, um, how you make contact using awareness and coherent thought and group coherence <clears throat> as a team. Now, you know, the, the, the special thing about close encounters of the fifth kind is that it's the first category that was uh, described that connotes humans empowering themselves to make contact as opposed to a passive event. In other words, a close encounter of the first kind uh, in the sort of categories would be a sighting of a craft within a certain distance. A close encounter of the second kind is when it leaves some kind of physical evidence. It may be electromagnetic, it may be a landing trace like in the Provence case where there was an ET craft that landed in a lavender field, etc. and so on. A close